Heavenly Father, thank you for this time to be with you. We invite you in this place. We invite you, Father, into our hearts. We pray, Father, that you would inspire us today afresh and anew and that you would help us do, in fact, what our first song says. Trade our sorrows, Father, for the joy of the Lord. We praise you and we give you thanks for this moment. And in your name we pray. Amen. The first song will be on the screen. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my hasn't had a chance to practice together for a couple of weeks so amen 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 please remain standing you're going to see another song up on the screen let the river flow this one's a little softer and uh, tells a wonderful story that we can claim for ourselves dead man rising to life Let the poor man say, I am rich in him. Let the lost man say, I am found in him. Let the river flow. Let the blind
welcome to worship. Please be seated. The heart for the Harrisburg area, and we uh, make new and growing disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, so glad to see everybody here today. Uh, especially the people who went on the mission trip, and Becky, it's a nice to have you back after your trip, and um, I know I wasn't here last week, so maybe you were all here last week, except for, yeah, <laughs> I don't know, so what can, that's right, and it, it's great to have everyone here, and uh, to hear everyone worshiping, it just fills me with something really wonderful. I, the Holy Spirit's present here for sure. Um, I'd also like to welcome everyone that, who's worshiping with us online. Um, we, we're glad to have you with us and uh, we hope you'll continue to join us or join us in person. If you have prayer concerns for, oh, I am not totally prepared here. Um, <laughs> We have prayer re request cards in the seat backs of the chairs in front of you, and we also have visitor cards for anyone who's visiting us, so you, if you'd fill this out, then we'd be able to contact you. For those of you online, uh, feel free to contact the church office uh, with any requests or needs. You can do it by email or by calling, either way. Um, so. Welcome. We're really happy you're here. And so now please join me in the call to worship. Give ear, O people, to teaching. Incline your ears to the word of my God. We will not hide them from our children, but tell them to the coming generation. That they should not be a stubborn and rebellious generation whose heart was not steadfast and spirit not faithful to God. May they not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and set their hope in God. Okay, please stand and we'll sing Praise Ye the Lord the Almighty. It's number 482 in the hymnal and the words will be on the screen. So often we are complainers, not seekers. We proclaim our innocence and justify our anger when so much in life does not go the way that we had hoped. We blame God for conditions entrusted to our stewardship, 
We become stumbling blocks, not facilitators of God's design. Let us seek reconciliation with God as we pray together the prayer of confession. Sojourning God, you call us on a difficult journey. We come with so much baggage, guilt, shame, fear, and longing. We remember how things used to be, forgetting that the way has always been difficult. We long for an easier path in this world with wealth and security and without the struggle. Christ, you call us to hand over our burdens, to take up the cross and follow you. You have shown us that we must deny the facade of ease that is promised in this world and instead do the work of justice, mercy, compassion, and kindness. May we have the strength to let go of our sin and the longing for the world's false promises and instead take up our cross and follow you. I have to say that really um, complainers, not seekers, proclaiming my innocence and justifying my anger when things don't go the way I want. Boy, does that describe me so much of the time. And this, this prayer has really, really uh, spoken to me. But the wonderful thing is that God is ever willing to grant our forgiveness, grant us forgiveness rather, and we cannot receive it if we're unwilling to be changed by it. So as long as we focus on preserving our own lives and protecting our own advantages, we'll be lost. If we want to be Christ's followers, we have to deny ourselves and take up the cross, not as a burden, but as a joyous symbol of loving and giving. Confessing and repenting, God will overcome evil among us with good. Amen. And now uh, the song, Jesus at a Distance, words are on the screen. This one's a new one, and so you'll have to uh, listen carefully and get used to the song. Sing it when you're ready, and uh, let's stand.
be our prayer every day. Have a seat. That's a great song. <coughs> our scripture reading for t uh, today is Psalm 63, verses 1 to 5, and it is located on page 479 in the Red Pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you here with all your smiling faces. You're in God's places. Let it wave to the camera back there. Say hi, everybody. Today we're going to talk about faith, and I brought this in. Does anybody know? You can go ahead and pick one up if you'd like. Do you know what that is? Corn. Yes, it's corn. It's a kernel of corn. <coughs> How many of you like corn in the cob? about this kernel of corn that looks pretty small, but when we plant it in the ground, it will grow into a tall corn stuff, taller than me, probably tall as Mr. Chilko there, <laughs> and it will give us six, at least six ears of corn on it. Now this is what the corn looks like your parents bring it home from the supermarket or from the farm stand. Right, here's the corn. Now how do you know there's corn inside this? That's not a trick question. It's a good question. How do we know? Let's look at this. Yes, and it goes by the shape, by the fill. We're going to, I'm going to get down too, and we're all going to Take the husk off this corn, and we'll see if there's some corn to eat inside, okay? Thank you. 
This is like faith in God. We have faith in God even though we can't see him. In fact, the Bible verse for this message is from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we cannot see. So just like the ear of corn, God is here. And there's ways I know that God is present. One way is because the Bible tells me so. Another way is when I look around at the beautiful world and the stars in the sky and the universe, it's just too perfect to be in a, a random <coughs> creation. God was, had his hand involved. Another way is by our Christian friends. The minister in the church, our teachers, our Christian friends, they help us to see God. And finally, when we worship God and when we pray to him, he will give us the assurance that, that he is present in this world and he's present here for you and me. So we know that God will help every one of us when we call upon his name. And from here, we're going to pray. We'll say, thank you, Lord, that you are present even though we can't see you. And thank you, Lord, that when we trust in you when we go to heaven we will see your face and we will praise you for the rest of time and all god's children said amen great well good morning everyone good to see all of you your nice smiling faces well i want to read the uh, second half of psalm 63 psalm 63 verses uh 6 through 11. And when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul follows hard after thee. My right hand, thy right hand, upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion of four foxes, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you in the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, seeking thy presence, not only in the midst of us here, but in our lives, for we know that the promise is that you will dwell within us. Father, we pray for thy grace, that you would open our hearts and our minds with wisdom and understanding, that we might see the truth of thy love, and we might understand the depth and the breadth and the length and the height of that great love that you've shown to us in the death, burial, and resurrection of thy dear Son. Be with us now for thy glory, for Christ's sake. Amen. Now, Psalm 63, I have, uh, I guess I have about four or five favorite psalms, and you're, <laughs> you're going along a little journey with me as the months pass by. We've already done 27 and 42, now 63. I've got a couple more, but... Uh, they happen to be just favorites of mine. That doesn't mean all the psalms aren't great, and there's uh, great verses in each one of the psalms. But David writes this psalm when he's in the wilderness of Judah. It's similar to Psalm 42. He is fleeing for his life, and he longs to worship God in the sanctuary with the reading of God's word and the fellowship of like-minded believers. According to Charles Spurgeon and Martin Lloyd-Jones, both of them, the occasion of this psalm is most likely when David is fleeing Jerusalem because Absalom has created a rebellion in 2 Samuel chapter 15. 
David was compelled to vacate Jerusalem. He had no choice. He is fleeing for his life. He's confused, and he's full of difficulties. His life is in great danger. His soul is in distress. People whom he thought were faithful became traitors. And instead, they assisted in the rebellion. His situation could not have been worse. No water, no food, few friends, no shelter, none of his normal comforts. Absalom should have immediately sent men and destroyed David, and it would have been done. That would have been the end of it. Absalom would have been king. This was Ahithophel's recommendation. He was a counselor to David for many years. He immediately expressed his loyalty to Absalom, and he gave Absalom this advice. He said, I will lead a force of 12,000 men, and I will catch David in the wilderness and destroy him and all the men that David was with. In 2 Samuel, Chapter 16, verse 23, we find the following. And the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God. You want to know what God's thinking? Go ask Ahithophel. To counter Ahithophel, David sent his faithful servant Hushai back to pretend to advise Absalom. And Hushai advised for Absalom to wait before the attack. The Lord was gracious in his providence and confounded Absalom, for for Absalom took Hushai's advice and chose to wait. Now, that's an interesting situation. And I always sort of wonder why Ahithophel so quickly turned on David. And you might wonder the same thing if you read through the passage. Ahithophel seems like God communicated with him in an unusual manner. I think it's always important when we see things like this in the Scripture that we ask the question, why is this unusual situation here so quick? Seems a bit odd. Well, Ahithophel is the grandfather of Bathsheba. His his granddaughter had a tragic end to her marriage because of David. Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, was murdered through David's desperate attempt to hide he was the father of Bathsheba's child. When David had learned Bathsheba was married and the granddaughter of Ahithophel, his most trusted advisor, He should have come to his senses and abandoned his plan to have an affair with Bathsheba and to murder Uriah, her husband. Instead, he forced himself upon her despite this information. His decision to sin in this way had tragic consequences, not only for him, but for his kingdom and for the people of Israel. It is likely Ahithophel held this resentment and was waiting for the opportunity for revenge. This is a tragic story, indeed. David's life has many instances where he was irresponsible and brought trouble to his soul, family, and nation. I must recognize, however, that as I view my life, I have many times made a mess of many aspects. And the consequences are found not only in my life, but in the lives of my children. It is important for us to take responsibility for all these things, lay them down at the cross of Christ, and continually seek the Lord. For he is gracious. He was gracious to David. He will be gracious to me and be gracious to you, no matter what the sin. Let's return to David's situation. His circumstances were literal and physical. David is not concerned 
about those cir the, these circumstances in which he finds himself. He's rather concerned with his spiritual needs, not his physical. In Spurgeon's Treasury of David, he introduces this psalm with the following comment. This is unquestionably one of the most beautiful and touching psalms in the whole of the Psalter. Spurgeon goes on to state, the psalm is aptly described by Clause as a precious confession of a soul thirsting after God and his grace and finding itself quickened through inward communion with him and which knows how to commit its outward lot also into his hand. Its lesson is the consciousness of communion with God when I am tr in trouble and the sure pledge of deliverance. The psalm provides me with a wonderful and peculiar consolation. From the text, I find an account of how David dealt with an extremely trying and troubling situation. Is it not? Your own son has created a rebellion. You have had to leave Jerusalem very quickly, your home. Here is this man of God, hemmed in, as it were, in the wilderness. His son has premeditated a rebellion against him. The kingdom has been torn from David. His most trusted advisor, Ahithophel, and top general have turned on him. This is an account how David faced it all and how he reacted. It teaches me and countless thousands of others through the centuries how to react and how to act in these sorts of situations. Many things can snare me. For instance, how about the snare of intellectual belief? I need to know if I just have an intellectual belief. I need to discover, is Christianity more than a theoretical belief? Do I just believe a set of doctrines? Or is it something that will stand the test of hitting the road and offer real practical help in time of need? Christianity's truth is very acceptable in its order, in its doctrine. Provides me guidelines and guidance for life. It can be very satisfying to the intellect. But the real value of Christianity is how do I react in times of trouble? There is also the danger of depending on the house of God or the sanctuary, as David puts it. David says he wants to see thy power and glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. But he's not in Jerusalem. He is fleeing for his life. The sanctuary in the Old Testament represents the presence of God. If I wanted to have the presence of God, I went to the sanctuary. I went to the temple. I went to the tabernacle in the wilderness. What will happen? when I am taken ill and lying on my back at home or in the hospital. I am prevented from having fellowship. Every one of us, sooner or later, will be in a wilderness. Even if we have not been in one already, because there is at least one final wilderness that we must all pass through, and we must do it alone. This wilderness is death. Verse 1, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. There may be some wavering, but the Christian will make it his or her object to seek out God and cling unto Christ. Peter, in John 6, 68, in response to Jesus asking the question, will you go away also, says, to whom shall we go, Lord? For thou hast the words of eternal life. The early in that verse, verse 1, reminds me of the children of Israel as they went out and they gathered the manna in the morning. And if they waited too long, it evaporated somehow. What is David's desire during this time of affliction? 
My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh, my body longs for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there where no water is. This is not some vague desire. It is a very profound feeling. David's not saying, well, let's just try prayer and see if some mystical thing will happen. This is a longing to enjoy the presence of the Almighty God who can meet all of our needs. David's greatest need at a time when one of his most beloved sons, Absalom, was conspiring against him was not his circumstances. Rather, it was his relationship with God. Here David is in a dry and thirsty land, without water, surrounded by enemies, awaiting a battle to the death with his son. His most important concern was not those circumstances, although these circumstances did drive him to this place. The desire of David's heart is, my soul thirsteth for thee. Physically, David was thirsty, and if this desire was profound, yes, I find, yet I find David thirsting for God. The mark of the Christian is the desire for an intimate relationship with God. There's nothing more important. In verse 2, David longs to see thy glory and power. Even in the Old Testament times, there was, there was something special about hearing the reading of God's word and the consideration of the wonder and magnificence of God as creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all things. How much more in the fullness of times when Christ has come, manifest in the flesh. Christ has gone to the cross, died, he's been buried, and he's been raised again the third day. He has now ascended into heaven to ever make intercession for his saints. He also dwells in the heart or the seat of affections, the place where our emotions are, by means of the Holy Spirit. and gives me confident expectation of the glory of Almighty God dwelling within me. This is to experience the wonder of God and the Scriptures. Oh, may I behold the glory of his wondrous face as I trust in the work of Christ. Looking at verse 3, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. David is saying it is better to have God's blessing than to live a thousand lives without it. Thomas Brooks writes, divine favor is better than life. It is better than life with all its revenues, with all its appurtenances, its honors, its pleasures, its riches, its applause, etc. Yea, it is better than many lives put together. It is, in a sense, the difference between Lot and Abraham. Lot had his eye on the plains and the cities where he could make money. Abraham put his eye on the mountain and was content to dwell there. Paul in Philippians 1.21 expresses it, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. True life is found only in Christ. Look at Philippians 3.10, that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering. This is the whole object of living, to know Christ. And as David puts it, thy loving kindness is better than life. David is not concerned with his condition, 
but rather how he might enjoy the presence of God and his loving kindness. This is the test for me. What are my priorities? This is an uncertain world. Things are always on the edge of one crisis or another, or so it certainly seems that way. The news media makes it out that way. What is the most important thing? Is it to go on living, prolong life? For some, this is the most important thing. It is to go on living, and anything threatening this is terrible, but not for the Christian. Thy loving kindness is better than life. For the Christian, there is the realization that the world is passing away. I'm only here for a short while, and then I pass off the scene. And my place will be taken by another. It sounds so simple and obvious, and yet it's the key to understanding life. Paul in Hebrews 13, 14 writes, Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The world always wants me to concentrate on it. In the newspapers, you don't find too many of them anymore, but books, journals, entertainment, television, computers, Internet, social media. Well, you name it, <coughs> there's something out there to distract me. It's always fixing my attention on this life. It's the whole fallacy of man and sin. There's something else telling me, and I hope it tells you about the existence in this world that will not continue. Life in this world will never completely satisfy. The child of God is someone who can quite honestly say, I don't know what it is, but I've never found complete satisfaction in this world as such. No, never. Oh, I... I've been interested, I've been attracted, I've been helped, I've been moved, I've had, I've had enjoyment. But there's something inside of me crying out for more than just air. Something longing in my soul. There's something crying out and says, I must know him, Christ, who is my Redeemer. It's partly because it's a world of trials and tribulation. Christ says, in the world you shall have tribulation, John 16, The cares of this life, the things of the unexpected are here, and I cannot avoid them. If I can just stop and think about it, I know it. But the devil keeps me so busy, I fail to think. And when... And when in trouble, I forget what I need to do. The world is mainly a vain and empty show, even at its best and highest. As Christians, I can see through all this, and I should not be carried away by it. When David speaks of loving kindness better than life itself in verse 3, He's saying something like this. If you have ever been in love, if you have the desire to be in the presence of the object of your love, more than anything in the whole world, if someone is lovesick, they are most unhappy because of a separation. I can offer them money, a book, I can offer them my house. I can bring friends along, offer them company, but they are lovesick. I can offer them the world. It's useless. Multiply this feeling by thousands upon 10,000. This is what David is feeling. The knowledge of God is more precious than the whole of life, all of it put together. In verse 5, David writes, 
His soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. This is the description of complete satisfaction. The world cannot give it. Christ never fails. He satisfies the mind. He gives understanding. Even in afflictions, I should not be perplexed because I have a total view of life and know God's power and his purposes. In verse 7, David says he has complete confidence in the Lord because thou hast been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Verse 7. This is the ultimate experience to know what it is to be under the shadow of his wings. Think about if you've ever been out to a farm, ever seen little chicks running about, pecking here and there, trying to imitate their mother, and suddenly a dog or a cat appears. And whoosh, the little chicks rush together and get under the shadow of the wing of their mother. This is what God's wings are like. He will uphold and not let go. If these things are true with David, how much more so with me? In the light of what Christ has done and is coming to take up residence in me, can I say, Thy loving kindness is better than life. Is my confidence in Christ? Is Christ the supreme object of my desire? This is the test of my faith. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Would you pray with me, please? Father, Again, we thank you for thy grace, for the goodness of thy blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Work in our lives and our hearts for thy glory. For we look to thee for Christ's sake. Amen. You need this back? <laughs> for our time of communion. I'm going to invite you to sing a song with me. We, uh, it's become a, a recent uh, addition to our worship service called Come to the Table of Mercy. You'll see the words on the screen. You don't need to, uh, don't need to stand and to sing this. I invite you to make this uh, an invitation to your own heart to come and be with the Lord at this table. Come to the table. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come, the Lord's invitation, receive. Again, come to the table. Come to the table of mercy, prepared with the wine and the bread. All who are hungry and thirsty, come and your souls will be fed. Come at the Lord's invitation, receive. Snail scarred hands. 
We won't be using the liturgy today. So I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Let's bow our heads as we prepare for communion. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for gathering us together at this table. Friends in Christ will come from east and west and north and south and come to sit at table in the kingdom of God. That is what we do now, Lord. And we thank you that you have opened our eyes through your word to see Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It is by his sacrifice that we are saved, that we are given the opportunity to confess our sin and to be made right once again. We come before you now, Lord, as people who are confessing. We actively confess the sin that happened in us just today. Lord, we repent of that. We turn our lives to be in alignment with yours. We ask, Lord, today that as we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup together, that we would be fed and nurtured, that we would be the body of Christ into the world, and that by our living, new people would see something about your life. Lord, today we lift up all of these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he had gathered the disciples together in the upper room, and giving thanks for the bread, he then broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Friends, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. This cup is poured out so that you may be saved so that you might know the risen Christ as he comes in glory. Thanks be to God for this. May I invite our elders who are serving today to come forward. Father God, as you have fed us at your table, we ask, Lord, that nourished and strengthened now we might be your people out into the world. Give us uh, the vigor and the enthusiasm and the courage to, uh, to share what we have known and seen of you, uh, of the, the love and mercy that we have received from you. Uh, we we uh, open our hands to give away all of these things for your glory and honor, and we pray it now in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. amen. I'd invite you to stand as we say together our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. They are on the screen and in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father who will come again judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And let's uh, offer our prayer now. Uh, how might we pray for the people of God? I'd like to just uh, be thankful, first of all, for the mission team back and forth to Mayfield, Kentucky, uh, safely uh, with um, just, uh, they served with joy and with gladness and with uh, all of their energy. I think we're all a little tired this morning, uh, those who have come home, but uh, thankful for them. Uh, how else might we pray today? Yes, go ahead. Oh, my goodness. All right, we're going to pray for a woman named Linda, neighbor of Sue's, who committed suicide, her son. We pray for that family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. Okay. 
Okay. All right, we're going to pray for Eric as he's uh, looking for a new job. We're going to pray for, for Morgan as she goes off to her next phase of her education. Good to see you this morning. Uh, n- nutrition, did I hear that correctly? Excellent. How smart we pray. Go ahead, Jane. All right. We'll be glad for the Stimmel's 41 years of marriage. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Yes, I imagine so. And, uh, and Ellen begins treatment this week, I understand. Next week, okay. So we're going to pray for, for Ellen's uh, chemo treatment. We're going to pray for a friend named Aaron uh, who's having surgery tomorrow. All right, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise uh, for being the people of God. It is with much joy and gladness that we have been received into your family, that we together know ourselves to be followers of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the mission team who served so beautifully with Samaritan's Purse last week. I pray, Lord, for the people of Mayfield, Kentucky. That is, they continue to rebuild after a terrible tornado uh, that uh, you would watch over them and that uh, Samaritan's Purse ministry among them would be a light of Christ uh, and and to to help that community to evermore become uh, who you have made them to be. So be with Mayfield, Kentucky, we pray. We ask, Lord, today that uh, with Sue, uh, we would pray for Linda uh, and uh, that family who's Uh, son committed suicide so lord be with them in the midst of those many questions i'm sure and the grief that they must face now uh, a a, a laden grief Uh, just be with linda today Uh, we pray today for eric as he um, has been laid off uh, from work and ask lord that as he uh, searches out a new place that you would provide for him uh, a new job that uh, would bring uh, even more than the one before, that this would be an even better situation for him and that uh, you have opened for him a new door uh, for new fulfilling uh, work uh, to support him and his family. Today we pray, Lord, for Morgan, uh, one of our own, um, one who we've seen grow up so beautifully. We ask, Lord, today is that she goes into the next phase of her education and starts grad school, that you would watch over her as she moves to a new place to be among new people uh, in a new setting. Just ask, Lord, that you would open all the right doors for her and that um, as uh, these next two years will be more preparation uh, for serving the people of God in the career that you have called her to. So watch over her today. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, for Ben and Jane and their 41 years of marriage. Uh, just love um, the, the beauty that their marriage brings to the world and the smile on their faces as they continue to love one another. So, Lord, be with Ben and Jane for many more years of marriage. We thank you, Lord, that uh, Ian is back to his family after many year, uh, we months, many months of deployment, almost a year of deployment with the military. Uh, just ask, Lord, as they learn to be with one another again, Ian and Rosie and little Quinn, that uh, you would um, s- smooth up the bumps that will inevitably come in, in their reunion. So watch over them and protect them. Be with Ellen as she begins chemo in another couple of weeks. Um, May that be a quick process um, that is complete in its healing, we pray. And we pray, Lord, for uh, a friend uh, uh, of Rebecca and I named Erin, who's having uh, fairly major surgery tomorrow. So watch over her and protect her. Give her doctor's wisdom. Lord, we release to you all the burdens that are uh, 
weighing us down this day. We release them to your care, to your sovereign will, to your grace and mercy. And Lord, our hearts leap for joy for knowing you, the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. Be with our offering this day. Use it to support this ministry that you call us to. We thank you for the givers, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, a few announcements for today. Uh, I see that there's uh, peanut butter still being collected. That's awesome. We have to specially think about CD Nutripacks as the school year will soon be cranking up, and those backpacks full of goodies will be heading out to homes again. Uh, we do pray uh, for that ministry. If you'd like a moment of prayer after worship today, if you'd like uh, a moment just to talk about your next step of faith, maybe that first step, that would be awesome. Uh, whatever step you're on, I'd be happy to talk with you and pray with you after worship today. Uh, there is our last Summer Fellowship Wednesday night, uh, the 9th. Is that the 9th? Yes, it is. Wow, time is flying. Uh, August the 9th, uh, come join us at uh, the Low Home at 6 p.m., and uh, we'll have some time of uh, fellowship over the table uh, and uh, sing some songs together and pray for one another. Uh, so that'll be our last summer fellowship. The car show is coming up at uh, the Wellsville Schoolhouse coming up on September the 2nd. And so if you know of someone who maybe has um, a special car that they'd like to share the story about uh, at the Wellsville Car Show, uh, that would be awesome. Um, and uh, come on out. It'll be fun. Uh, I guess that's all I have slides for. Uh, one of the th other things that we need to, that, that's coming up here in about a month is our church summertime picnic, end of summer picnic. It'll also be at the schoolhouse down in Wellsville on September the 10th. And uh, we're thinking that that might be also the day that the mission team gets to share the news of their experience uh, in western Kentucky as well. So I think all of those things are going to come together. But we are having the uh, the 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 picnic down in Wellsville. There will be carpooling for those of you who would like to, and uh, we'll find a time and a few drivers to meet here and to head on down there for worship and for our picnic. Uh, things that I've missed. What else is going on? What's all the news? Yes? Do we need a, a, a volunteer for somebody that has a truck to help her pick up the chairs? She wants to okay. So all right. So. Is there a particular day for that? It was down, uh, Carlos. I think that was Julian. Okay. So, so if you have a moment and a truck, uh, <laughs> see Julian, and uh, she'd love your help. Yeah. All right. Please stand. And if you'll close your eyes and extend your hands forward to receive this blessing, hear the word of the Lord. May the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever, God's people say, Amen. Amen.